Welcome to episode 216 of Sports Geek. On this week's episode, I chat with Australian sports pioneer Nick Vanzetti about esports live events. Welcome to Sports Geek, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host who listens to podcasts at 1.5 speed. Please tell him if you do too, and he'll speed up next time you meet, Sean Callanan. Thanks, TJ Joel. My name is Sean Callanan, and I do want to know, do you listen to podcasts at one and a half or even two times speed? Uh, myself, I listen to podcasts about one and a half, and then occasionally when I listen to them at normal speed, it all sounds a little bit too slow. Um, and sometimes it is a bit funny when I talk to someone in real life and uh, they, they're amazed how slow I speak at times. Uh, so yeah, let me know. Uh, send me a message. You can do so uh, via email, sean at sportsgeekhq.com, at Sean Callanan, at sportsgeek uh, is how you can find me. As always, you might be listening to this podcast at sportsgeekhq.com or on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, before I get into my chat with Nick Vanzetti from ESL, uh, we recorded that at PAX, uh, a local gaming uh, festival, convention, uh, uh, amalgam of, of all things gaming and geek culture. Um, it was good to catch up with Nick. Before I do, um, I love working with podcast listeners. I had one recently call up and say, hey, I've been listening to the podcast. I really should call Sean. Um, if you have that feeling, please uh, take on that urge. Uh, I love working with podcast listeners, whether it be on new content initiatives, uh, you want to look at something new um, or you want to try something different, uh, you want to look at something for a different audience or a different platform and you need uh, a new fresh a fresh set of eyes or ears, um, brain <laughs> in effect, uh, to come up with some new ideas. Um, happy to discuss how we can help there. Or it might be just reviewing your social media and content efforts, helping develop campaigns, uh, either that be for, for growth of your audience, engagement, um, helping develop things for sponsors. Um, obviously, I'll discuss later a really big announcement around the digital dollars process. Um, we're more than happy to discuss that, how we go about using the digital dollars process to develop both digital audiences, uh, strong content, strands or franchises if you want to call them that um, as well as develop revenue um, and so all of that work sort of fits in that process um, and it's very malleable to uh, work in many different forms so if you've been thinking hey i should reach out have a chat um, please do so um, sean at sportsgeekhq.com uh, as i mentioned in the opener i caught up with nick vanzetti at uh, PAX. Uh, PAX is a gaming convention held here in Melbourne over three big days. Uh, it pretty much takes over the whole uh, Melbourne Convention Centre uh, with a showcase of uh, games, games developers, uh, technology, uh, consoles, uh, PCs, uh, manufacturers in the space um, and also a growing part of that of that uh, festival is is esports um, and ESL are a big part of that being a both a organizer and a content producer in the space. Uh, Nick Vanzetti has been someone that's been in the space for a long time um, and it was good to catch up with him to get a get a get his point of view on esports as an industry but then also from that live event aspect that him that he and his team do so well. So here is my chat with Nick Vanzetti from ESL. We are here at the the echoey halls of the Melbourne Convention Centre, far enough away from PAX so we can actually hear ourselves and not overwhelm everybody. I'm here with Nick Vanzetti. I'm not going to say your job title because Dave Harris asked me to get you to say your job title. Nick Vanzetti <laughs> from ESL, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Sean. Um, so first of all, what is your job title? Because it has changed a little bit <laughs> and it's, it's now a little bit longer. Have you got a bigger business card? Uh, I do. So it can be shortened into the letters, but it's the Senior Vice President of Asia Pacific Japan um, and Managing Director. So For ESL. For, yes, for ESL. So it's Senior Vice President, Managing Director, 
Asia Pacific Japan of ESL. It is. It, a that is. A, that is a mouthful. Um, so Khaleesi, before, breaker of chains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he did. He did. I think he did mention something along those along those lines. So before we got to you get to where you are now, uh, how did you get your your start in the esports scene? Uh, like I started out as a competitor. I played um, a little bit too much Halo. With some uni mates, yep. instead of studying, we'd start on a Friday night, we'd drink beers and play System Link. There was no internet uh, yep. online gaming for Xbox at that time uh, and turned out to be a lot of fun and eventually we'd still come over on the Friday nights or the weekends but we stopped drinking the beer and it would affect our performance and we yep. wanted to win. Yeah. Uh, we got quite competitive. I ended up uh, entering a local tournament and uh, won that and then also won the national tournament as well. So... We just had a love of um, competitive gaming at that time. Hanging out with mates and the whole team aspect of it was uh, very appealing. Um, and then there's a much longer story as to, as to how we got here. And esports was definitely not a big thing back then. It was just a, a bit of fun. So, so yeah, so back then you're – and it is a common thing of I was a player, now I'm in the, the scene. Um, but you're obviously you, – but people don't know, you're a builder of this scene. So what were those early stages for you – both being a player but then starting to look at tournaments and leagues and how you got actually into the space as opposed to into gaming, I suppose, is probably how you've answered sure. first, firstly. Sure. So, well, that's how I got into the, the competitive aspect of yep. play. And I attended a tournament in 2004. It was the World Cyber Games at the time, sponsored by Samsung. And, uh, you know, it was a great experience but a uh, very small industry. Yep. Um, and continued to compete. Uh, for a few years and went away and had my career and it was never even a thought that it could be a business at that time. Yeah. And What were you working in? Uh, I did uh, retail store management yep. at EB Games, so yep. within the ecosystem of gaming, but then uh, went into film and television. I was yep. living in Brisbane at the time and there was uh, a slow turn in the film industry and um, not enough work. Yeah. So I started gaming again um, many years later in my late 20s and realized having a look at the gaming scene again, it had grown so much in the five years or so that I, I'd been away from uh, competing. Yep. And there was an opportunity there to help a local event and the the organizer of that event was doing a really poor job. Like yep. basics, event 101 failures, um, you know, booking a, a 200 person hall for 400 people, that, yep. that kind of stuff. So I just lent some of my expertise um, from my previous Job and so roles. You, and so you'd had some experience both from a film and TV and, and set up and that kind of stuff? Yeah, and it was it was basic to be honest, just event management, um, pulling various stakeholders together to, to put a community event on. Um, I, I took over that event and uh, invested a little bit of money, bought some uh, computer monitors and some Xboxes um, and it was a fantastic event. It went really well and, you know, I was five grand uh, dead on the credit card. Yep. And thought, oh, shit, well, I've bought all this equipment and I'll, I'll keep going. Yeah. Um, and I still have my van left over from the film and TV industry and started the Australia's first circuit for video games, which was uh, myself and a couple of volunteers driving up and down the East Coast, uh, running events in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. And we just did that consistently for five years. Every year, we, you'd know that there would be a stop in each one of those cities. Uh, teams would accumulate points in competing uh, and eventually we'd you know, have a bigger prize pool at the end of the year. And eventually the, the business side of it in Sydney, the gaming publishers took note of that and uh, asked us to run events for them. They gave us, a, you know, a, a sizable budget, a couple of hundred grand, and it turns out that you can do a lot more yep. with a bigger budget. Yeah. Uh, and we're still here today. Well, that's terrific. <laughs> so, and so then that leads to uh, you at ESL. How did, the, how did that come about? Sure. So <clears throat> I don't want to tell my whole life story. No, but, um, gonna, but, uh, it's a, but I mean, for me, like, it is, it is moving quick, but it's like there's certain – like points in the road that are really important to where you are now and, and what you've been running. And, you know, we'll get to some of the major big events you've been running recently, but these, it interests me and hopefully everyone's still listening now. <laughs> so I hope so too. So we were sort of doing our own thing as a hobby business, right? Yeah. For a few years. So between 2009 and 2012, we, yeah. were, we were running that circuit consistently. Um, and I was still working at the time. And at one point we, we're receiving enough attention that I, th I thought maybe there's a possibility that if I moved to Sydney, yeah. I was from Brisbane at the time, all the gaming publishers are in Sydney, um, maybe we'll get more of these opportunities to make 
make a commercial go of running esports events or, yep. or even just gaming events. And at the time, I decided, bugger it, I'm going to give up my day job. Yep. Um, I moved to Sydney, uh, left my girlfriend of uh, a couple of years in Brisbane while she was still studying. And my best volunteers and comrades from Tamworth, Gold Coast, New Zealand, Adelaide, all moved to Sydney. None of us were from the, from Sydney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we uh, set up shop in a in a house there in a share house, which was horrendous. After yeah. <laughs> you don't want to go back into that environment again. Um, but again, we were too early, so yeah. I had to find work, contract workers in events and project management. Did some some work for Microsoft Windows. Um, and a few different gaming arms before the business really took off. Yep. And then at around 2014, so after a couple of years in Sydney, you know, we were self-sufficient. I could pay myself a wage. I was uh, starting to pay um, the other four guys who, who made the trek with me and we had a small company and we moved out on our own into a, an office in Lane Cove. And that was probably the first real moment where we were like, oh, wow, we, we can actually- it's an actual business. We can, yeah. we can yeah. do this now, we can grow this. Um, and it just snowballed. We got more more pitches, more more work, and and more projects. Um, and we went from five staff to ten staff, and now we're about twenty two full time staff today. Yep. We have about thirty regular uh, freelancers across the various cities. And when we do the massive events like the Melbourne Esports Open or Intel Extreme Masters in Sydney, we have actually uh, over one hundred and forty staff to help put on those events. So. So, you know, when I first started looking at the esports space and it's, you know, looking at it from a, from a sports business point of view and, and traditional sports and seeing what's it is and you see all the online activity and all the digital activity and then, you know, what happens really a lot in traditional sports is the live element and the, and the events. Like how, how important are the events from an esports point of view to get that connectivity of fans, you know, to the games and seeing the players and, and because it becomes – very similar when you're in a stadium full of fans, whether they're what following, watching a game of tennis, basketball or whatever, or, you know, one of the titles we're seeing here at PAX. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, we, I started in events, right? Yeah. Um, it was a very social experience. Uh, we didn't just do it to, to play the game. Yep. And that's often a misconception about esports from those not as initiated. Um, you know, gamers can be very social people and particularly – the esports uh, folks, we're playing a multiplayer game most yeah. of the time. Uh, there aren't that many 1v1 esports. Yep. So there's the, the team aspect, there's playing against friends or foes and, and that um, rivalry that, that pops up. And the best way to experience that is in a live event environment. Um, and, and the spectator's ability is, is something that, you know, even in our early days, the spectators were the competitors. Yeah. So I've even seen the evolution of that um, in the last 10 years to actually surprise myself. Yeah. Um, I knew that in Korea that there were people crazy enough to be watching this kind of content, but yep. in Australia it w wasn't really happening. But I think the continued evolution of gaming as an acceptable culture and just that um, – like fan idol experience yep. still exists in esports. Like, oh, how did he pull off that move? That yeah. guy's crazy. He's been yep. training for hours. Or yep. people still want to experience that. Which is they tr completely translate. You know, when I'm trying to explain what's esports, I'm like, I grew up as a basketball fan and watching all the things that I, I couldn't do that Michael Jordan can do. Or, you know, what a football fan is looking at, look at Ronaldo and Messi. And go, oh, I can't do that. You've got the same wow factor of fans exactly. of game, of esports going – how do they do that? And then they go back with their controller, with their PC, whatever they're playing, and try to do it themselves. Exactly. And as the production values, sponsorship, et cetera, began to increase in our industry, then as with it becomes the, the glitz, the glamour, the big stage. So um, there's that aspirational element as well. You want to perform the same game you play Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on a big stage in front of an audience. Yep. Um, people want to do that. And so, like, uh, you, you mentioned the Melbourne Esports Open, which was held at uh, Rod Laver Arena in Margaret Court. Um, it was the first year this year, over over a weekend. What were some of the what were some of the takeaways for for that event being year one, and you know, introducing it to to a, to a market that hadn't been to a big event like that? Um, well, just to 
probably even to rewind a little yeah. bit before we get to the Melbourne Esports Open because yep. it, it adds context, right? Yep. So before you asked me a question, I didn't answer it about how we joined ESL. Yeah. Oh, yes, correct. So, yeah. Go, let's um, go back and that's, there. And that's my fault, but it, it links into the Melbourne question. So yep. when – our company was essentially uh, bought into by ESL. So we've uh, emerged as part of a joint venture with ESL. And uh, for us, that was super important because we were becoming a bigger fish in Australia, which is a fairly small pond. Yep. And in esports, again, this asp- aspirational storyline, the best competitors in Australia, they want to go overseas. They want to play against the best in the world or they want to be the best in the world. Yep. And working together with ESL meant so that ESL, we... So ESL, for the context of everyone, is what? Sorry, ESL, largest uh, independent esports company in the world. Yep. Um, have offices in the US, uh, Brazil, Latin America, and originally founded in uh, Cologne in Germany. So very strong in Europe. Uh, they were acquired themselves by MTG, Modern Times Group, a yep. Swedish media company, and uh, with that became their geo rollout and international expansion. So they, they came knocking on our door because we had a, a fairly big presence here in Australia. So working with ESL allowed us to basically create these pathways for players to get to that stage yep. and then qualify into something much bigger. Yep. It also allowed us to bring the existing event properties that they had, mega events, which we describe as an arena event with over 5,000 people yep. um, to Australia. So okay. so it all kind of started with, you know, me wanting to bring a large scale mega event to Australia that the Australians could be proud of. They'd never been to it, one of these before. Yeah. They often... Uh, staying up till 3 a.m. watching the U.S. Like time yeah. zone. So previously they'd been either watching a stream or, or, or of a tournament, you know, whether it's on Twitch or YouTube or whatever, they're watching it on but haven't – and know that there's a live arena component but they've never felt it. And Exactly, exactly. So once we had secured the Intel Extreme Masters, which yep. is a 14-year running uh, event series yep. with Sydney, that's when we were really able to prove – that w- this concept works. We can get six, 7,000 people in an arena to watch esports. They loved it. Turns out the Australian crowd went ballistic. They made a hell of a lot of noise. They were yep. one of the most energetic crowds in uh, global esports. Yep. And then from there, it's like, okay, where to next? Yeah, and that's and, the buzz. Like that's, you know, a, there were, you know, 60 minutes we're doing reports on on that and, you know, you're on there and, and saying this is what esports is. It helps to go mainstream. People understand. And so then that... Now, and then, we can, now we can weave it back into back Melbourne. Into Melbourne, that's right. There we go. Um, so <laughs> that leads into Melbourne saying, "Well, hang on, Melbourne and Sydney for the for those who are listening internationally are very competitive cities. Um, uh, they are always uh, comparing uh, events and things like that. And so that that you know, oh, Sydney's doing something interesting in this space. Melbourne's gone and put its hand up. Massive fear fear of missing out. FOMO was was kicking in. I think <laughs> yep. it, it created a lot of buzz, a lot of press around uh, the event in Sydney and. Uh, we were working with our great event partners, uh, TG, yep. TG Live, uh, who obviously run massive events here in MCG, like the Brazil-Argentina match. They're doing the basketball next year. Yep. Um, so they're having big conversations with the uh, Victorian government all the time about how to drive visitation. Yep. And obviously the Victorian government's very forward thinking in terms of the future and what are the, going to fill the stadiums in five, ten years' time. Uh, and esports is is definitely one of those one of those things, so it just made sense for us to put together a case um, of a content experience that could allow people to experience an esports event here in Melbourne. But we had to do things a little bit differently to Sydney. Yeah. So Sydney is like the Formula One of esports. Uh, we get the best teams from Brazil. Yeah. Y- uh, Europe, etc. It's like, a, it's like an all-star, uh, all-star experience. Correct, correct. Yeah. We had $300,000 prize money, etc. Um, turns out that's really expensive to do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to get all these players in all the time. Yeah. Um, he, here's a fun anecdote for you. When we get those top teams in, um, we get one hotel room for the players and we get one hotel room for each team to warm up in. We strip out the hotel beds, the yep. fridges, the everything. We put computers in the hotel room yep. and that's their warm-up room yep. uh, for the entire week. So super expensive. So we can't do that all the time, right? How do we create a massive experience in Melbourne? And also to be a little bit more family friendly, we had um, uh, a lot more accessible game uh, games at, at yep. Melbourne. We had over 10 different titles, League of Legends, Overwatch, Fortnite, um, across Rod Laver Arena, Margaret Court Arena. And we wanted to create something that, okay, maybe little Timmy who's 
12, 14 years old, plays a bit of Fortnite's pretty good. How, how does he come down, gets to play on Margaret Court Arena yep. where the Australian Open is, yep. mum and dad take a photo, he has the time of his life, yep. maybe he wins a JB Hi-Fi voucher and then he goes next door into Rod Laver Arena and he sees the best Australian New Zealand competitors in Overwatch yep. and our goal was really for A, little Timmy to have the best time and mum and dad to go, you know what, this esports thing is not that bad. Yeah. It's yeah. not that bad. So it was funny because, yeah, so I went there on the um, on the Saturday um, and, yeah, I was am- – amazed is the wrong word, but it was really encouraging to see how many mums and dads were with, were with their young boys and girls that were, like, checking it out. And it was funny. I was standing uh, there uh, once and hearing a – hearing I must have been 11 or 12-year-old, he was, like, complaining to his dad. He was, like, going um, – I don't know about all this sound and music and lights and stuff because he was used so used to watching the game, <laughs> at, you know, in in the streaming environment. But he was loving it. But he was it was fo- foreign to him because he hadn't, you know, he doesn't have this like, you know, a football fan goes can go every week and enjoys the noise. Well, we we definitely want to make sure that we have more of these event experiences, so it's not so foreign. We yeah. want to get these guys out of the yeah, bedroom was, too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't. Yeah, but it, it was like he was having a ball. But he okay. was, but he was. It was like I'm just not used to it. It wasn't. A, it wasn't complaints. <laughs> the wrong word. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't used to it. Yeah. But but it was like, and it's like when I, you know, most sports. Uh, administrators say once you get people to a live event they're like oh it's completely different it the aha moment it. right yeah. yeah and we we definitely wanted to create that aha moment in melbourne so for us it was a, a massive success um all stakeholders happy and i think when you just look at we were looking around the precinct and we saw these parents and uh, you know we had it the it was a sunday of father's day so there were a few dads with their kids there yeah. it was um they were really enjoying it yeah and the thing was because it was that you did have multiple uh, stages, so you could go. Oh, I'm going to go watch, you know, the the main stage. But then you had the multiple stages on Margaret Court, and you know, exhib- exhibit hall had lines around the uh, around the thing just for kids wanting to play Fortnite again, like that kind of thing. It it did give that festival feel that we you know, that you know when you go to the Grand Prix or you go to the tennis or you go to the race. It sort of had that feel, and so I think there's a there's a lot there for you know years two, three, and four. Exactly, and that's that's where we're going. I mean, it was year one. We've got plenty of room to grow. Uh, the whole festival experience is, is what we want to do and create more content and, and experiences for people beyond just the, the pure esports tournament. So, so from on the podcast, and I've spoken to a few people in the esports space. Now, admittedly, they've mostly been in League of Legends or the NBA 2K guys. Esports is is such a wider space. Like when you think of esports and all the titles, like how wide is that? has that space and all the different titles that are available well it's it's massive um and for those that don't know esl is a title agnostic company so we're essentially a events and content creator we're we're kind of like at times as well as a league um administrator yeah so we're kind of like cricket australia and espn together like yep. we, we can run our own leagues and then at other times we will do work for hire for publishers to create their events for them yep um so we're we're a bit of a mixed bag but the the most important thing for us is that we um will never hitch our wagon to just one title so there are so many different esports titles so in the last uh Two or three years, we've probably worked across 15 different esport titles. So I've mentioned some of them. Uh, some on console, Call of Duty, uh, Overwatch, League of Legends, Rainbow Six on the PC, even World of Tanks, yep. um, all sorts of uh, weird and quirky and unusual and, titles. And the more that I, you know, and it is a bit of you've got to go down the rabbit hole of all the different titles. One thing I do hear is that the, that the gamers and the audiences of them they're not all the same. Like there's some real <coughs> stark differences and it must be a real challenge for you as a content producer and a, an event producer to go, oh, we're rolling out, you know, a Rainbow Six and there's some nuances that you have to do for those titles. I've got a, some great analogies for the sports fans, yeah. right? So StarCraft is a, a 1v1 title. It's been around a long time. It's all about concentration and outwitting your opponent yep. um, as well as tactical ability. Um but a more gentrified, uh, mature audience of fans of StarCraft, I'd liken it to golf. Yep, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Whereas we've got Counter-Strike, which is a little bit more boisterous, team-oriented, yep. um, 
kind of game. You know, we broke a food and beverage record at uh, the Palms in Crown here because of the amount of booze that yeah. <laughs> the guys had ordered. They, as spectators, it was a great experience. And there's everything in between, right? Yeah. So you can have audiences that are a little bit more reserved. So in terms of challenges, sometimes, you know, as a broadcaster, you want to create the emotion and sometimes it can be difficult. Guys are sitting down on the stage, they're, they're playing a game and they're looking at a screen. Um, the most emotive you see the the players are when they've just won yep. um, and that winning moment they're holding the trophy up sometimes the guys in certain games are so shy they don't want to be on camera necessarily yeah. Uh, yeah. and that's changing in yeah. esports I think a lot of it is that these players have not been used to it yep. whereas you look at the, the spotlight is now going on the, them a little bit more correct so yeah. you're starting to see some um, real characters and personas come out a little bit of acting up whereas so you know a one minute trophy celebration um the guys hold up the trophy and we're trying to capture that moment and then they'll put it straight back down yeah whereas the afl i watched the afl grand final yeah those guys can't let go yeah, they're, they're celebrating couple, they're for about couple, five hours <laughs> and do a couple of laps <laughs> let alone <laughs> one minute <laughs> yeah yeah so it must be yeah, frustrating as a content producer. No, no, no. Celebrate more, guys. Yeah, celebrate more, guys. Uh, yeah, celebrate we don't more. Have to slow mo and stretch this. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things uh, yesterday uh, we attended uh, EGAA, the Electronic Games Association of Australia, if I've got that correct, which you're a, which you're a founding member of. What's what? Um, why is that important? So this is a, a pretty serious topic, Sean. Yeah. Um, so we're a new and emerging industry and it's growing so fast and there's a, a number of new stakeholders coming into the into the industry. Um, and the purpose of the EGAA is to create a little bit more structure around um, the various groups that are in the industry and set a basic level of standards for, for us to follow yep. and for us to tackle some key issues. And some of these can be really basic issues or things that you, you wish wouldn't be a problem. So... Um, uh, player visas, for example, they're, they're also a way to, um, or the EGAA, sorry, it's an important function for us to try and work together with government to try and solve issues that affect the industry. Yep. So, for example, Intel Extreme Masters Sydney this year, um, a, a couple of a Ukrainian and a Turkish team had uh, qualified to compete in Sydney. Yep. And we couldn't get them in the country in time. Okay. Um, based on the speed in which they could get their, uh, their visas approved. Whereas if... Uh, esports was more formally recognised. Yeah, if they'd have been a basketball team, it wouldn't have been a problem. Correct. Yep. Correct. So these these are kind of some of the things that we need to tackle as an industry. And then in addition to that, there's also some more base level uh, issues that are legacy problems from being a grassroots um, kind of movement. Yep. So we've got... How do you add that professionalism to professionalism, the Professionalism, you know, yeah. player contracts, um, working together with teams properly, making sure there's a, a fair set of standards and practices. Yep. Yep. And so, yeah, so it is just a matter of having a place where that discussion happens so it's just not happening in halls and in bars around events like PAX. Correct, and exactly. So you have some structure and you've got to have those conversations with governments and, and that's where, you know, when people say, you know, and I'm not getting into the easy sports or sport rubbish, right, but that's what sports has done for, you know, that's been a big part of sports administration is getting in that, that infrastructure and, and architecture that it needs to talk to governments and, and make sure there's some rigour around what you're trying to do because esports has moved so quickly so uh, in a short amount of time, it, that hasn't happened yet. No, that's exactly right. And then who is the right person or the right body to, to make these moves? Um, our view is that we need to take a assortment of people and stakeholders from different parts of the industry. So ESL is obviously a tournament organiser, but we don't represent all the interests. Yep. Um, we've got uh, teams, players, everybody sort of coming together in one area to create a unified voice when we are creating policy and making an approach towards government. Yeah, so, yeah, so I attended yesterday and it was a... Yeah, eclectic mix because there were people like, well, yeah, I'm a gamer, I'm really interested in the space or I'm a developer and I want to develop a title that might be an esports. Exactly. Uh, or, you know, people like Ian Roy looking at, you know, the esports industry from an integrity point of view. What does that mean, you know, because he knows what it, what happens in that space in, in sports like cricket and football and stuff like that. So um, it's sort of like, you know, going through your teenage years, you're starting to mature and, and you've got to tackle all of those issues because it is serious. Yeah, it is. It is serious business and it's only predict predicted to get so much bigger in terms of 
revenue and size and scale. And uh, if we don't get things right uh, in the early days, we'll be in trouble in the future. Well, exactly. And if you've looked at um, in, only in the last maybe five weeks, PwC come out with with lots of uh, mentions of esports, even if they're spelling it wrong in their <laughs> report. Um, it's uh, esports, no dashes, no capital S's, everybody, <laughs> just for reference. Goldman Sachs did the same. They came out with a big old report with big old capital S. I'm like, no, we don't need that. But like the, the conversation is starting to happen around growth and revenue and all of that kind of thing. I think last year was my first time coming to PAX and just, you know, just the craziness that is PAX being a gaming festival, you know, so it's consoles, it's PCs, it's um, – and esports is part of it. And I remember last year standing at the ESL stage chatting to you and you were – showing me this thing it's like oh it's battle royale and everyone just runs around and they you know, it's hundred of them and one wins i'm like <laughs> yeah that was Fortnite. it like it was like it started like a couple of weeks before pax last year and now it's you know got four or five stages it's scary the pace of change in in our industry yes. yeah and then the thing is it's like you know does it become you know do people want to then play it competitively like do you want to get the best Hundred Fortnite players in a room in a you know in a stadium, who knows? And you know that's where the development's happening. Um, so I want to finish with the closing five because I know you've got to get back into the the madness that is PAX. Um, do you remember the first sports event you ever attended? Yeah, I can actually. Uh, so my father's from WA, is massive AFL fan, uh, but moved to Brisbane. So I grew oh, up in good. Brisbane. I thought you were going to talk about the Eagles. It still well, hurts me I, as a Pies man. Oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Eagles would be my backup team. Oh, so I was very happy that the Eagles won, actually, Sean. Oh, Sorry, right. mate. <laughs> That's, uh, right. I've, I've walked right into that one. But anyway, I interrupted your but, memory. So uh, growing up in <laughs> Brisbane, Brisbane Bears are the first AFL team. I, I remember being in primary school. Do you remember you um, – maybe you don't, but you used to be able to collect the the can return. So – yep. Um, sorry, soft drink cans, yeah. right? This is a very weird story, but my first sports memory was cruising around a Brisbane Bears game, which and we held at ten, the Gold did you get Coast. 10 cents a can or five cents a can and in it South was Australia? A, it, it was a school thing, though, yeah. back then. You know, you collected cans and you got some pocket money. It was yeah. awesome. But I, I was so happy to be at that sports match because there so were just cans, cans littered everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but I did I did see a bit of the the, the Brisbane team, and then I, I, I followed the, the Lions through the three consecutive premierships. Oh, yeah, where well, they beat Collingwood <laughs> twice. I mean, you're just uh, – <laughs> I, I shouldn't have asked this question. Um, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Um, you would have been, so this is, I normally ask this of people going to lots of events and say, do you have a favorite food memory? Like go to a, especially in the US where they're really upping the gourmet food options. Um, I haven't been to enough esports events to see if they're doing, do you have a favorite food memory? No, I've got to go boring here. Sorry. Just, yeah. a, just a plain hot dog with uh, ketchup. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah it's uh, always a, a classic. Um, what's the first app you open in the morning? It's Slack. Yeah, uh, straight on the work Slack, which is uh, where all the messages come in. And being part of a global company, there's always an industry update or, or something coming through overnight. So that, that's yeah, you wake that's up and fix. someone's trying to move the meeting that you woke up for. I love that <laughs> yeah. one. I love that one. Like you're getting up at six for a seven o'clock meeting. You go, oh, can we push it back an hour? I'm like, yeah, I can't snooze my button now. I'm up. <laughs> um, who should the uh, who's someone that you reckon that you follow that you reckon the the podcast listeners should follow potentially if they're getting you know interested in esports or i'm going to give a, a recommendation that's a little not not a person yep. but a um an esports update uh tool it's called synopsis c-y-n oh yep. yeah i know synopsis, uh, yeah. yeah there's a lot of great industry and business knowledge less about players and yeah so it's, know, a, team it's an results email or have you yeah it's an email it's a weekly email that comes out with the the biggest um updates in esports business okay I think it's in my inbox somewhere. I, I subscribe to a lot of things. I'll, I'll be honest. I subscribed to it and didn't read it for about three, four months. And then ever since I started reading it, I'm like, like, oh, wow, this is where I get all my news. Okay, synopsis. Well, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, lastly, and you can answer this as yourself, but also potentially with your ASL hat on and the events and content you're promoting, what social media platform is uh, your MVP? For us, it's Twitter. Yep. Um and interestingly, it changes so in different markets, right? So we're doing a lot of work in Asia at the moment, and I was quite surprised to find in Indonesia it's got to, it's got to be Instagram, yeah. Which I likened to you know fancy filters and <laughs> black yep. and white stuff, yeah. Um, but for me in Australia, New Zealand, it's it's got to be Twitter. Uh, most of the gamers are on there, and uh, a lot of uh, global news also comes it's, in through uh, yeah, Twitter. It's been very, yeah. very consistent um, in that. Twitter is still a real, real power platform and 
the niche of esports is all over that. Um, and most of the way we talk to our audience is, is through uh, social media updates, primarily through Twitter, yeah. So where can so we, to wrap up, where can people find you on the internet if they want to send you a tweet or uh, reach out to you? Uh, at Nick Vanzetti. That's Pretty a, simple. That's the best way to do it. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming on the pod and taking some time away from the throng of, uh, of packs. Um, good I've l- enjoyed it, especially those Collingwood jokes. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just here for, to, to entertain. I'm um, happy to be here. So thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of packs. Thanks very much, Sean. Cheers. New workshops on audience, content, distribution, valuation, and pitch following Sports Geek's Digital to Dollars process. Go to digitaltodollars.com. Thanks again to Nick Vanzetti. Uh, you can send him a tweet. Nick, N-I-C-K, Vanzetti, V-A-N-Z or Z for my American friends, E double T I. Uh, you can send him a tweet and say and ask him a question about esports events or the Melbourne Esports Open or IM. Um, as I said, I went to Melbourne Esports Open, really enjoyed the day and also enjoyed seeing the new fans, the dads, uh, the mums, taking their kids, helping them understand esports as a live event. Um, and I think it's uh, definitely something that uh, will continue to develop. Uh, as I said in the opener, uh, Digital to Dollars uh, is is going really well. Really looking forward to uh, doing a, a, a league-wide workshop uh, with the AFL, the Australian Football League, uh, in November, uh, walking through with the club's uh, executives in the digital space, but also the commercial space, looking at knowing their audience, knowing their content, understanding their distribution, uh, social media and email and where it all fits, and starting the starting the process of developing uh, a solid rate card, so it will give us the building blocks to uh, develop the pitch um, and help the digital teams better understand the commercial side of the digital business, and then also have the commercial team understand how to best sell digital and sell the assets that they are they are building. So, if you are a, a listener and you're in the AFL club space, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, if you want to reach out beforehand, if you've got any questions, uh, please do so. Uh, send me an email, Sean at Sports Geek HQ. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to running a really engaging uh, session for a whole day um, in that in that league setting. After running um, a really successful session in a shorter form at uh, at Seat Dallas earlier this year, so um, looking forward to do that. Um, if it's something that you or your club or your league uh, want to tackle and help your uh, your teams drive more revenue from digital and understand the value of their assets, um, please uh, reach out or you can check it out at digitaltodollars.com to either uh, check it out or uh, pre-register for the book that will be out in 2019. Uh, until next episode, uh, for those of you who are in Sports Geek Nation, um, I'm really appreciating the, uh, the contribution, especially in the weekly AMAs, the Ask Me Anything. Uh, for those of you who don't know what an Ask Me Anything is, it sounds a lot like what I just said. Uh, we, uh, we have Sports Geek Nation members. If you're not a member, you can go to sportsgeeknation.com. Uh, you can go to sportsgeeknation.com slash members area to see uh, th- who, is, um, who is up every week. Um, and then a member um, like uh, John McCauley, who did it last week, um, will put their hand up and say, ask me anything. And in John's case, there was lots of questions around technology and mobile and OTT. Um, and John was really willing uh, to give up his time and his expertise to answer those those questions. So they've been uh, yeah, really effective. Um, for those of you who don't know your way around Slack, please reach out to myself or, or Jolly to understand how to use it better. Um, there's multiple channels uh, of conversation happening in the Sports Geek Nation Slack. Simply click on one of the channels, uh, hash AMA, and join it. And then you can uh, listen, lurk, and ask questions, uh, join in the conversation. Um, and we've obviously got topics, uh, channels around specific topics uh, like esports, our discussion today with Nick, um, uh, sponsorship, technology, digital, social media, and the like. So. If you've, got a, if you've got a particular area of interest, um, please uh, join in and contribute. 
uh, share what you're doing. Um, uh, we love to see some case studies of what people are doing um, or simply comment on what other teams are doing. Um, recently, we were, there was some good commentary on the Colorado, uh, I think it was uh, one of the Colorado teams uh, that was pretty much went off the tools from a social media point of view for a week. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some commentary of people on, wh- you know, whether they'd done it before um, and uh, why they'd done it. And so there's a little bit of uh, talking about the industry in there. So if you're not part of Sports Geek Nation, I'd love you to join up. Go to sportsgeeknation.com uh, for more info um, and sort of inspired by those AMAs. Um, I'm going to start doing a Q&A style short form podcast. Um, the only thing that I uh, need right now is your questions. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way and method to collect those questions. Um, I might start doing that in Sports Geek Nation, um, but I'd love you to go to uh, my page, uh, facebook.com, Sean Callan and Speaks, or on LinkedIn and message me. Message me with a question and... Um, I'm going to come out with a new format uh, that will be short form, uh, six to seven minutes where I answer qu- your questions uh, in a podcast. Hopefully, uh, you will enjoy that. Um, I look forward to collating some of the questions now and going to start rolling that out as a weekly uh, podcast. Uh, until uh, next episode, uh, my name is Sean Callanan. Thank you very much to Nick Vanzetti from ESL. Um uh, please reach out to him if you want to know more about esports. Um, but until next episode, my name is Sean Callanan, and you've been listening to Sports Geek. Join Sports Geek Nation access to exclusive Slack and Facebook groups with regular Q&A sessions with Sean Callanan. Go to sportsgeeknation.com to join. Need help with your digital rate card? Not sure how to price your assets? Is there a disconnect between digital and commercial? That is where Sean works best, in digital divorce counselor mode. Book a time for a call with Sean to discuss the Sports Geek process. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash phone call. Go to sportsgeekhq.com for more sports digital marketing resources.